Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the City of Ekuruleni to celebrate World Town Planning Month. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm Shannon Durejo from Crema Media's Contract Publishing, and I'll be assisting our panelists this morning. Please note that the Q&A function has been enabled, so please post your questions into the Q&A box, which you'll find on the panel at the bottom of your screen. You can also interact with the panelists and other attendees in the chat box. The webinar is being recorded and you will be sent, it, it will be sent to you afterwards. We are also, um, yes, yeah, so we'll send that to you once we are finished with this webinar. I'm now going to play a video about the city of Ekuruleni. A city to live, play and invest. The city of Eguruleni, a city focused on strengthening social cohesion with the pursuit of prosperity for all its residents. It is a city where you can live, play and invest. The city of the future. This futuristic city models the home to approximately 3.4 million people with a renowned claim of being the manufacturing hub of South Africa. But there is much more to this developing city. As Africa's first aerotropolis, the city of Eguruleni is filled with over 238 lakes, dams, world-class casinos, entertainment centers, including premium lifestyle estates and world-class golf courses. The city is also home to O.R. Tambo International Airport, the busiest airport in Africa, serving the entire continent and linking to major cities across the globe. Many of the world's leading airlines fly into the airport. Supporting this is a network of roads, rail lines, telephone, electricity and telecommunication grids that rival first world countries. Infrastructure supporting well-established industrial, commercial and residential complexes. Welcome to the city of Egoruleni, Africa's first erythropolis city. The city has adopted uh, the economic transformation trajectory underpinned by the 10-point plan which include amongst others uh, manufacturing revitalization, uh, the Eretropolis Master Plan implementation, the acceleration of ITZ SCZ program, uh, land availability for strategic development. The Eretropolis Master Plan is a very important strategic uh, document that uh, will help us to promote freight and logistics next to the airport, giving our strategic location into, uh, into the OR Tambo Inter International Airport. So we want to attract investors within those particular sectors in order to boost manufacturing in our space. Manufacturing constitutes about 20.5% of our sector. Therefore, it is very important uh, not just for us as a city, but for the province and the country and the continent at large. So it's important that we make sure that uh, all strategies are towards ensuring that we revitalize the manufacturing because it's an engine for growth in the city of Egoruleni and the country. Live, a city so good you want to live, play and invest. The city of Eguruleni is host to some of the country's most exquisite lifestyle estates, such as the ever-alluring Serengeti and Ibotse golf and country estates, with family-friendly community recreational parks for the little ones like Kiluli's Farm and Germiston Lake. Also on offer are extensive road transport and Wi-Fi connectivity, with a network of libraries and a range of prestigious shopping experiences such as Bedford Centre, East Rand Mall, Eastgate Mall, Festival Mall and Lakeside Mall dotted across the city. Play, theatre, historical museums, heritage sites and a number of driving ranges and golf courses are on offer, including the spectacular Glendower, which annually plays host to the SA Open Golf Tournament. You will also find some of the country's best casinos and entertainment facilities in the city, including the likes of Emperor's Palace and Carnival City, 
beautiful culinary spots with a range of family entertainment and park activities such as Wild Waters Adventure Park and Festival Mall Ice Rink. And let's not forget the ultimate IMAX cinema experience at Eastgate Shopping Center. On a monthly basis, the city is also host to the Eguruleni Jazz Comes Alive event, which features leading jazz and contemporary artists from around the country. Invest. As mentioned, the city is home to OR Tambo International Airport, Africa's biggest and busiest airport on the continent, as well as being the manufacturing hub of the country with a significant logistics corridor along the R21 highway. The city boasts an extensive transport network across rail, road and air, with the Galulis interchange being the busiest in the southern hemisphere and Germiston railway hub one of the busiest on the continent. The city has the infrastructure to support investments like Prasa Kibela rolling stock development, Lord's View Industrial Park and the Danel Aeronautics Aviation Hub, Riverfield Industrial and Residential Development, as well as the Tambo Springs Inland Port. We believe through the effective implementation and rollout of the Aerotropolis Master Plan, the potential and capabilities of the city will beam through. We hope to see you more living, playing and investing in our city. Come live, play, invest in Eguruleni, the Aerotropolis City. That was really inspiring. I'm now going to hand over to our, um, for our, to our host, Palesa Tita, Head of Department of City Planning at the City of Ekuruleni. Over to you, Palesa. Palesa, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Am I coming across? Yes. Good morning and welcome to everyone once again for joining us during this uh, World Planning Month as hosted by the City Planning Department here within our city, Ekuruleni, which turns 20 years old this time after our amalgamation in the year 2000. It's certainly an honor to have whom we have as media partners, as also uh, partners in the built in We seem to be experiencing a bit of technical difficulty with the sound. Um, Palesa, are you able to hear us? No, it seems we, we seem to have um, lost Palesa there. Um, I wonder if we should just perhaps move on to Anati, who's going to share a presentation with us. Well, let's see, wait, let's see if Palesa comes back. No, it seems we've lost her. It's now eight minutes past 10, and I'm hoping that in true professional uh, um, style, we're not going to be delayed in this regard. Can I then receive confirmation um, from you, Shannon? Sorry, Palesa, we seem to, I seem to be losing some um, sound connection from you. Uh, Sorry, there seems to be a bit of a technical glitch there. Okay, you're back now. Do we Let's have try again? Sorry, repeat that. Do we have all our panelists on board to begin our session? It looks like we do, yes. Thank you very much. So I'm going to begin with a fellow colleague and my partner in the built environment. This is the head of department, Mr. Anati Zitumani. HOD? Uh, thank you, uh, HOD and uh, the panelists, as well as the member of the public who have joined us. Uh, let me just get my screen to assist me with my wonderful things to do here. 
Uh, I will present on the, yes, uh, my name is Anati, and uh, I will present on the growth and development strategy for the city of Ekurleni. In short, we call it the GDS. So I'm sure it's actually clear now and it's actually on your screens. All right. Um, once again, uh, this is just a presentation. Uh, we're going to highlight a, is the, we, this presentation will be available for Perosa later on. And uh, the presentation will be talking about the purpose, uh, the as was and the as to be, and, um, and also the pillars that we have on the GDS team, as we call it, the growth and development strategy. And um, so there's some annexures that show the origin where the city comes from and the mega drivers and the grocery items for, for Peruza. So um, going from the purpose, the aim of this is to actually get the city to 2020, uh, What happened with the Metro was that in 2020, there was a growth and development strategy that was developed uh, for 2025. And on the left, you can see what it was intending to do, uh, your urban renewal, job creation, and so on. And then um, we came along with the, in 2012, the reasons, uh, the GTS 2055, which actually takes the Metro to, to the next level. And there you can see um, the reasons for it. It was just to continue with the success of 2025 and uh, improve and uh, also limit and, and, and also um, deal with the limitation that the Metro had. And um, in the JDS 2055, we actually had uh, five strategic imperatives, one being to re-urbanize that looks at um, infrastructure related matters. And the next one talks to re-industrialize, re as you are all aware, we are a manufacturing hub and uh, that also creates jobs and create revenue for the city. The third pillar being to regenerate the metro, and that talks to environmental matters, uh, which deals with climate uh, change matters. The next one, the fourth one being your remobilize, which deals with your social empowerment. And um, then the last being your regovern, which talks about corporate governance and, and so on. So um, what we've done in, in, in this exercise is uh, we actually have got the five uh, pillars and then we actually projecting in three transactions um, where the city will be uh, in 20, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the plan is to be a delivering city by 2020. Yes, 2020, which is a well-managed, resourced, financial stable metro with no service delivery challenges. And um, the next, uh, which coincides the 2030, which is a capable city which uh, coincides with the NDP, your National Development Plan, which talks about industrial, uh, we plan to be industrial inclusive economy and the meaningful reduction of unemployment and uh, poverty. By 2055, the plan you should be right up in the air uh, where we can provide your clean, your clean green and sustainable um, solutions and uh, as a matter that is actually going to be leading on that. So um, going to the current scenario that we have as a metro, uh, this just details in each of those uh, five themes I've highlighted on reorganizing the status that we have. Uh, we have to deal with issues around human uh, settlements, housing provision, transport provision, as well as densification. Because the reality of it is that in no time from now, uh, we are going to have issues with, um, with space. So we have to deal with that one. And then in terms of uh, re-industrialize, uh, the issue that we have uh, now are issues around economic growth, employment creation, and economic diversification. As you can imagine before the Metro, we were starting, we were mining and then manufacturing. Now we're more logistics and, and related. And then the, on the remobilize, the issues that we have at the moment um, is issues around education and skills. I'm sure you'll recall the Metro was the only one without the university. And uh, this year, um, there was announcement by the president and the minister of education that the city of Ekurulene will have a university because the reality of it is that uh, when people have got skills, we have got a good capability to attract investors as we have got the skills that complement that. Uh, and also deal with poverty-related matters. On Regenerate, which talks environmental issues, 
Um, pollution and climate change reduction is a challenge that we have, which we should need to deal with. On uh, Regarn, once again, we talk about economic growth and employment creation. And on Regarn, uh, the issues that we have is, is issues around intermetro cooperation and working around with uh, our local governments and related matters. So this is just, I'm not going to go through all of this. It's a lot more in detail and it brings a lot of context on the as is in each of those uh, GDS team. You can see on trans, on housing, what are the issues that we have? 119 informal settlements on transport. We can see 60% of the commuters rely on, uh, on private transport and 40 on public. And these numbers should change if we need to deal with climate decisively. And um, so I'm not going to, so these are the constraints that we have, which deal with issues around land, uh, private land ownership and the high cost of uh, developed land and, and related. So these are the constraints and as well as issues uh -huh. around funding that you deal with, okay? So, um, and then in the job creation, you can see the issues that uh, the current status that we have, the decline in the uh, in, in investment in the manufacturing sector, and which is actually going to get worse now with COVID and, and related matters because industries, uh, some of them that could not produce during uh, lockdown, will have other challenges as well. Education, I think I did talk a little bit more about this one, uh, the skill set that we have as well, and in terms of policy as well, because we need to actually get policy, especially if I'm manufacturing, there must be a lot more talk around the green economy without chasing away investors on that one. Um, on the environment, you can see the, the, the related matters that deal with that. I'm not going to go through in detail. All I can just highlight there is uh, in 2018, we approved the sustainable, uh, the CO up sustainable strategy, and we are progressing well in dealing with matters on that front. So we, to get a, a uh, and then on the next one, the status on the social empowerment that talks a lot more on um, on health issues and uh, what I can just highlight on this one is um, we are progressing well. One of the key indicators that we have on HIV is on mother to child transmission, where we gave ourselves a target of less than 2%, which we are actually doing quite well, but it was a challenge that we had to deal with. Yes, we have issues around um, uh, EPWP uh, and related matters. And we are aware that is a city that not one size, uh, size, uh, one size fits all in our solutions in dealing with the social matter. So it's going to be a learning curve around that one as well. Um, on corporate governance, uh, this talks to issues around uh, ensuring that the city is financially stable, okay? And uh, the reach of it is metros need to find, uh, the issue that we have is the budgets that we currently have are not enough to deal with the needs that we have. So which means that we need to deal with um, finding alternative ways of, of budget and uh, with the increasing demand of uh, uh, the backlogs uh, in our case as well. So um, here there's a lot more that to deal with. Uh, so one of it is finance, one of it is on leadership as well. And, um, and also making sure that the metro is stable in terms of human resources and um, we deal with uh, issues around governance uh, decisively in, in that way as well. So here we are actually going to be looking, uh, I'll go through pretty fast on these uh, slides. And uh, this is just the strategic framework that we used for this one. So as you can see, there was uh, on the macro strategic framework, we looked at the vision for the city and those three transactions that we looked at. And also we looked at the sector departments um, in incorporating this. So we actually got the five, your urban environment, social and economic. And also the strategies that we looked at, we looked at uh, all those uh, strategies uh, within uh, the specific line departments. And then we actually got to a point that we get programs as well as sub programs to, to deal with this. And as we plan, we actually ensure that we align all of these plans with these uh, five pillars that are discussed and mindful of the delivering and capable as well as sustainable city going forward. So as you can see uh, in each of those, uh, so in the framework you can see on re for instance, 
you see the first line is to organize and then we look at issues around uh, urban integration and urban core investment so in each of those we actually break it down to find what is the strategy what is the imperative and what is the framework and then we develop programs that deal with each of those. So I'm not going to go through in uh, direct detail in all of the matters, but um, going further on the reurbanize, which is the main one, which talks about issues around um, uh, densification. And uh, we, we recently have done a, a master infrastructure plan where we have actually identified the number of uh, your backlogs in terms of human settlements. I'm sure you saw in the earlier slides that we have about 119 informal settlements and the city must have a way to deal with this as it is one of the much laws uh, human needs that people need to have housing to deal with that. And we just highlight the uh, current situation and then the desired on the right where we desire to be uh, to densify and uh, also get uh, skilled people within our space. Um, so this is just a continuation of the first one where we talk about uh, the programs now that we have and you can see with the star, the flagships that we look at. One of them, I'm sure you saw uh, it quite well in the video, the Aerotropolis, with the Aerotropolis master plan, which was adopted by the current council, uh, I think it was around 2018. And then also an integrated way for transport as well and also to deal with issues around township economies. So I'm not going to go through detail. I'll just highlight a few in each of those slides. In job creation, we have the same way where we, re we, sh we show the current um, situation and the desired outcome. That we are aware of the fact that there's slow economic growth, but we desire to have greener jobs and uh, also get uh, new uh, value chains created and uh, also getting the right skills, uh, the university, which will actually work, go a long way in dealing with that. And you can see, uh, once again, we have got the programs that we have uh, in terms of each of those uh, in, in re-industrialize the programs as well as the flagship. And the center, I think this is the Calex Dal uh, project that we talk about for the uh, sustainable industrial production. So I'm not going to go in a lot of detail, but just to show that the programs that we have developed and we thought of in dealing with these matters. Going to the environment, you can see the current situation and uh, the desired um, outcome that we should be at. And um, I won't go through in all details. You can see the programs that we have. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the programs, especially on the renewable energy, as you can imagine. Energy has uh, the bigger issues that we have in the country, uh, the supply from ESCOM and the need for us to actually deal with renewables. So these are some of the problems that we have. The plan for the current term was 10% of our energy to be renewable. So we try and check on that. Other than must just highlight uh, those and the policy around the urban environment, which I spoke about earlier on. On social empowerment, we actually have the current situation that talks on poverty and also the desired outcome, which talks about the capability of our human resources. And also you can see the programs that uh, we were considering in terms of the social empowerment, those three programs. And you can see the, um, the one flagship that we have, integrated service delivery and citizen uh, response one. So you actually can see what programs that we have on that. And in terms of effective governance, you can see the current uh, situation and the desired one uh, where we are building our human capital and acquisition of, uh, of skills and assets and ensuring that we maximize the value on those as well. Uh, you can see the programs that we have uh, on that. Uh, I'll just talk more about the need for government to the third one, uh, the column three, the need for government to work with private sector because the reality of it is metals or municipalities cannot work in isolation because they don't have the funds for it and the necessary skills. So it's important to work uh, with those. Um, so basically, um, as I'm concluding now, you just see the, uh, the history of the Metro 1886, uh, 
where it was and uh, started being an industrial city and uh, manufacturing, there's a lot of mining in that. In the 1970s, you know, where we started with deindustrialization, you can see the kind of roads that the network that came along. And in 1995, you see the redistribution, your growth and inclusivity, are, and as well as the amalgamation of the metro in the 2000s. So in 18, uh, you can see some of the, uh, the issues around the drivers, as you can see, what was the drivers back then, as well as the levers, as well as the results that we actually planning to get. I'm not going to bore you with a lot more details on this, because it's just for, for history purposes. And then uh, on uh, deindustrialization, you can see what were the drivers, okay, which was just the urban uh, industrial decentralization and the levers that came along with it and uh, the results that were expected to come along with it. Of interest is the fact that if you look at uh, the results, um, which created a challenge for us, which is still a challenge as we speak, the overcrowding and the backyard uh, dwellers in housing because uh, the families are expanding. Very uh, unique challenge for all cities, not necessarily our metro. And uh, on the last one, you can see your drivers as well. Uh, where we actually, the focus is on service delivery and the bill of rights and um, so I think um, I will just glide the slides and uh, just the, the last part for me would be what is our, our, the future that we're looking forward to be with, uh, with the limitations that we have and uh, the challenge. So one of them, I think I mentioned earlier on the limitation on energy. Uh, that we need a, a, a good mix in terms of, of that. I think uh, with NTP, they came up with a 50% plan that uh, the energy should be renewable by 2030, which I think is actually a very huge target. And um, as I said, and in the current term of office, the plan was to get 10% and we are well in track in dealing with that one. So technology, which also is, is a very good driver, I'm sure with... Um, COVID, we, I mean, we're presenting now in a virtual platform. So it's one of the things that is a good benefit for, for us. And we should look at getting technology in order for that. So I want, this is just the initial that explains what each of what I've discussed mean. And I will stop there, Chair. Thank you very much. Ashwati Palisa, you can, uh, if you can take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, my colleague. And uh, good morning once again to all of you who may have joined our session not too long ago. As the head of department for strategy and corporate planning, I'm sure you could all hear the passion in the tone of uh, Anati. His current role within our city is that he's responsible for long-term planning, research, knowledge management, monitoring, evaluation of the city's programs, and he is the champion for smart cities within the metro. So that's why it was important to have him on our platform under this very dynamic topic and to also allow him to share the story of our city as Ekuruleni. The HOD touched very much on the fact that we're trying to grow our city and moving away from what it was prehistorically as a manufacturing or just a purely industrial uh, kind of hub. We have a GDS, which, he's talk, which he has spoken to, and I hope this is going to allow our private sector. It's also going to excite you, um, National uh, Cocteau, as well as National Treasury, to be um, convinced that we have a clear and strategic path that's going to take us into 2055. Just to zoom in a bit and probably assist you all as attendees to the session, that we have a long-term plan in our growth and development strategy till 2055, as I've said. So how are we as a city going to get there? Shannon, if you can then assist me, we are going to then be joined by my fellow colleague within the city planning department, Andile, and he is going to talk to us about how then have we broken down the gospel of our long-term story as we've heard it from Anati. Andile, welcome. 
and Andil is responsible for infrastructure planning within the city. He's, in, he's within the Metro Spatial Planning Division. And uh, his role is to then assist us to formulate the financial program. We seem to have um, lost Palesa again. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to share my screen so that we can see um, we can see Andila's presentation. And come with the story of our city, of how within city planning we break down the growth and development strategy. Andila, can I share my screen so that we can uh, look at your presentation? Yes, ma'am. When you're ready to move to the next slide, you can just let me know. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Hi, good morning, colleagues. As HOD Bali Satsita has already said, my name is Andila Chaluza. I will be presenting to you a bit more detail on what the HOD strategy has just presented, which is to give you a bit of journey that we are taking as the municipality in realizing the objectives of the growth and development strategy that was presented here this morning. So next slide, please. So based on the strategic objectives that are defined in the growth and development strategy, we then asked ourselves, how do we go about to unpack these objectives into actionable items? And therefore we decided to determine what is the challenge that we need to overcome in order to achieve that. As a result of that, we decided that our biggest challenge is that if we cannot quantify what we have and what we want, we will not be able to measure what we need to do and because we will not be able to measure, we will also not be able to manage the growth and manage the growth of our city. So we decided that let's go on a journey and quantify, measure, and manage. Next slide, please. Based on that, and just to provide a bit of context, um, as HODs have both said that the growth and development strategy timelines gives us a horizon up to 2055, where we need to get the city to become a sustainable city. And for us to do that, within the city planning department, on behalf of the municipality, we have the responsibility of developing the metropolitan and regional spatial development frameworks that um, would give a spatial expression of the objectives of the growth and development strategy. And within that, to quantify the cost of developing that spatial development framework by means of an integrated infrastructure master plan, which looks at the cost of providing the services that are required to become the kind of city that we aspire to be. We also developed, or in the process of developing what we call a growth and management, growth management strategy, which essentially provides us with guidance in terms of where to invest, what to invest, and where not to invest, essentially do's and don'ts in terms of where we want to get to. And that is expressed through the formulation of precinct or local area plans that give us a guidance in terms of the development approach. And in terms of quantifying all of that into actionable items that are in compliance with the national treasury, that information is trickled down to the built environment uh, performance plan and the capital investment framework. 
I'm not sure if you can see beneath the capital investment framework, but we've got what we call a long-term financial plan, which essentially is a consolidation of all of the infrastructure requirements into a long-term budget planning process that will determine how we proceed financially in terms of financing um, our development goals, given the financial constraints that we have and how do we manage to go through that in terms of uh, triple P's, private public partnerships and other range of available funding options. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier a couple of policy documents and plans that link to the GDS and that we have taken a journey towards unpacking in order to quantify, measure, and manage our uh, plans. Uh, today, we'll be presenting three of those. One of those is the growth management strategy, which will be followed by the infrastructure master plan and the local area plans or present plans. Next slide, please. In terms of the growth management strategy, we decided to go about on a scenario planning exercise to determine a variety of um, issues that uh, impact in the way in that we plan the city. And one of the things that we looked at is obviously our policy in terms of the MSGF and compliance with uh, policy plans like the built environment performance plan and our desire to restructure the city to be a more compact and densified city. And we looked at a social index in terms of access to uh, services by the citizens. Um, if whether we are in a position currently to provide those services with inacceptable uh, distances to the citizens. And the structure index, which essentially deals with how we restructure the city into the kind of spatially transformed city that we desire to be. And we looked at a whole range of other indexes, such as environmental, economic, in terms of economic, how investable are we currently? Is our infrastructure built environment performing in a way that attracts the uh, investment that we require? And we looked at issues like mobility in terms of accessibility of our city and how we can provide um, the kind of um, opportunities that are available if we are reachable. And of course, we had to look at the demographic index to understand a whole range of issues such as um, urbanization, um, in migration, and, and all of those patterns. Next slide, please. Once we did that and we developed a whole range of uh, measuring tools, which I will not talk to here today because of constraints of time, but what I'd like to present to you is what is our preferred development scenario uh, compared to the current development and policy focus. And if you look at the map on the right, uh, currently our densification efforts meaning that our investment in areas where the city has identified as restructuring zone or integration zones in terms of the built environment plan is sitting at 24% and our urban expansion is at 76%. However, based on the exercise that we've done uh, in terms of scenario planning and playing around with the numbers in terms of how we can optimally densify as well as cut the cost of providing infrastructure whilst uh, we are able to um, uh, generate revenue from some of the investments that may come our way. So in terms of our preferred or sustainable development scenario, we are looking at 44% densification uh, as opposed to 24%. So key here is that we need to optimally densify and find ways of managing that. And the growth management strategy, what it does is that it will provide at the end business cases for specific nodes and corridors so that we are able to work towards this preferred sustainable development scenario. Next slide, please. 
of course, when you want to attract investment, you need to determine the land that you have. And as you know, as a city of Eguruleni, we have a challenge of dolomatic land. 52% of our land is dolomatic. So as such, we needed to be creative in terms of where do we go, where are we going to invest and how are we going to invest. That's why optimal densification is important to us so that we are able to use our land optimally and get as much return in terms of the investment while providing the services that are required by the citizens. As such, we part of the work that we are doing with the growth management strategy is to quantify the land that we need, particularly looking at residential business, industrial and commercial, open space, facilities in terms of municipal facilities, other facilities and roads. So essentially, if you compare the three approaches, one is the current policy on the far left. Uh, in, that means that the way that we are currently doing business. The second one is uh, providing basic level of service to the citizens, but not investing as much as we would like in terms of providing for, in terms of meeting our targeted goals. The only reason why we did this exercise was to try and understand what would be the impact of, for instance, if there's a shock in the system like COVID or any other shock in the system in terms of revenue generation, in terms of doing business, what are we likely to look at? But of course, the approach that we prefer is densification, which is on the right. And in, if you compare the land that is required, for instance, for residential in terms of our current policy, which is 45% of the land compared to the densification policy that goes down to 36.6%, about 10% less of the city of Eguruleni. So that is exactly what we're trying to do. It, th that will obviously push the cost of providing services down. And also there's a lesser operational requirements in terms operations and maintenance requirements from the municipality side. Next slide, please. And based on the three approaches, we then did a very high level uh, cost estimate of what it would cost us, what is the capital expenditure requirements for the three different approaches. As you can see that our current approach, uh, because we are not densifying as much as we should, and we are probably not investing in, in sometimes in areas where we need to invest for a variety of reasons. and. And if you compare that to the preferred approach, which is approach number three in terms of the capital expenditure, you will take note that we, are save, we will be able to save a whole lot more if we densify and um, um, follow the, the recommendations of the growth and development strategy. Um, the same is true in terms of the operational costs, as I've said previously, uh, our cost and maintenance, our maintenance and operations cost would be significantly uh, lower compared to the rate at which we are doing business today. So these changes are already being implemented, some of them in the department, and there are a variety of um, uh, initiatives by the department, uh, by the MMC for finance, for instance, um, in terms of how we can cut down on costs and, and try and, and, and reduce our operational expenditure whilst we are strategically investing our capital um, uh, budget. Next slide, please. Now that we've gotten a high level um, interpretation of the growth and development strategy in respect of the growth management strategy, meaning where to invest all of those um, desired initiatives that HOD are not related to. We are going to look at a quantification of the Metropolitan Special Development Framework to get a sense of how, what, how much do we need to plan for how long. So the infrastructure, integrated infrastructure master plan is a 30 year CAPEX and operational budget uh, infrastructure plan and it focuses specifically on uh, water and sanitation, roads and stormwater, um, energy, 
water and sanitation, as well as waste management. Next slide, please. As I've already said, the Eburuleni Integrated Infrastructure Master Plan is an outline of the financial requirements uh, to implement the Metropolitan Spatial Development Framework. As I already mentioned, this is a 30-year plan and it is an annex chart to the MSDF, the Metropolitan Spatial Development Framework. So it expresses the financial requirements of the Metropolitan Spatial Development Framework. Next slide, please. Um, we went through a process of scenario planning and modeling, obviously to fit within the growth and development strategy timelines to look at what would be the cost of providing these individual sector departments um, infrastructure in an integrated way. And in that uh, scenario planning and modeling exercise, we developed three scenarios. One was the scenario which is current, how the economy is performing currently, what is the budget in our uh, uh, bank account as a city, and how are the future demands matching that budget, as well as the condition of the existing infrastructure, which either needs to be upgraded or, and, and as well as maintained. So I simply here took um, uh, just one example from the water sector uh, plan, just to demonstrate the kind of results that come out of the infrastructure master plan. So it would tell you, for instance, your operating and maintenance cost over the duration of the program, which is 30 years. And 30 years specifically because we want to get to this stage by 2050, because the city has declared 2055 as the year that the city will be fully sustainable. So the program is designed in such a way that it is aligned to that program. So it provides you with the operational costs. It also provides you with decision-making suggestions, for instance, if the economy is performing in a certain way, uh, the projections is that we are going to generate so much revenue, there's gonna be lesser uh, grants coming from the national government. What are the options that are available to bridge that financial gap and how to manage it and how to keep the city in a financially sustainable um, uh, trajectory. As such, um, the infrastructure master plan details that per sector. I'm just demonstrating here per sector. It also details how the total revenue charges are going to be over the same period. So for those infrastructure services that we charge for, um, it's like water, what are they going to be the, and how does this assist in terms of gener gener um, revenue generation for the city, but most importantly, in terms of financing the operations and maintenance of the assets that we are going to be investing. So that's just a demonstration of how one sector, um, we, we've looked at. Next slide, please. Just again on the uh, same sector, which is water, just a demonstration of how much we require over a certain period of time. Now the program in the way that is structured, is structured in, in such that it follows the priority areas as per the policies of, of the city. So projects are aligned to a specific time frame, um, and that is across all of the sectors. So that's just the detail in terms of the capital requirements, capital budget requirements, as well as the operational budget requirements. Next slide, please. This is just a demonstration, again, using water of what the dashboard looks like to assist us with the planning over a long period of time. And that also assists the finance department uh, together with ourselves to try and come up with a determinable plan that is realistic. For instance, the uh, long-term financial plan, which will be um, completed in, in the next year and a half or two, is going to be the detailed expression of these long-term plans. So this assists in terms of figuring out what are the financial requirements at a particular time, how is that going to be financed, 
and what are the financing options that are available. So that's just a dashboard to assist with that. So there what you have is the demand of the infrastructure, the both capital and operations, the revenue that you can generate and all of that. And next slide, please. This is just a demonstration of, <clears throat> if you include all of the sectors, the dashboard also allows you so that you are able to see um, which of the sector plans, for instance, require much more infrastructure. As you know, roads and, trans roads and stormwater are generally the most demanding in terms of cost. And um, that was picked up in terms of this exercise and that obviously gets planned for. So uh, before I close, I think the objective of my presentation was just to give you an overview of how we take all of those strategic objectives and desires that HOD Anati expressed here and take them down to a level where we are able to quantify, measure and manage and where there are instances where we need to do revisions, we are at least guided by a defined process. And that process, whatever changes are made, they are affected across the different sectors. I think that is my last slide, if I'm correct. Oh, no, sorry, in terms of the infrastructure master plan. So taking it down to the local level, uh, just, is just to show how is the infrastructure master plan and the built environment plan um, from the bottom up uh, fits into this approach. So what we've discussed now is how we've approached uh, the planning across the city. So now we're going to look at a local area and how our local area plans fit to the, uh, the bigger picture. So we have a number of prison plans that we've developed at the city thus far, and they are focusing on specific areas that they recommend specific land use changes and strategic approaches. Just quickly, out of the prison plans that we have completed, uh, some of them in black have been approved in terms of spluma. The rest of them are in the process of being approved. We're just following final internal processes. So what I'm trying to express here is that even at local level, there is an approval process that ensures that the plans that we have at local level are in line with the plans that we have at the citywide level. Next slide, please. This is just a demonstration of where those um, precinct plans or local area plans are um, in relation to the strategic uh, pieces of land in the city and how they fit in into this network and their individual roads. Next slide, please. This is just a zoom in um, to the detailed level. So if you can, I'm not sure if you are able to, to see there, you've got three placing plans. So the whole approach in terms of uh, spatial restructuring and densification is that we focus on targeted investment. So this is just a demonstration of how we target a specific area um, uh, and, de and develop or formulate detailed um, uh, implementation initiatives to get the process going in terms of the GDS. So that is three different prison plans in an area around Kempton Park. Um, and those are just some of the projects for each of the different uh, prison plans. Next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, um, these local plans, because they are the expression of the success of the GDS on, on the MSDF when, uh, when, the, when, when there's investment in those areas, um, they, they require detailed coordination in both in terms of planning and implementation. So as a city, in terms of the present plans, um, our approval is by the city manager details at least gives high level instruction that these prison plans can only be implemented by interdepartmental structure that needs to be established. So each of the prison plans makes recommendations on how it is to be presented. So this is just an example of one of the prison plans. As you can see, there's a lot of consultation, there's a lot of due diligence, there's a lot of coordination and approvals that are required you therefore need uh, institutional structures to make sure that that work is done and what are their functions and the components for per, per function. 
So just that should demonstrate that right up from the GDS to the local area plans, we've got processes and means of ensuring that we, at the end of the day, are able to connect back to the strategic objectives of the GDS. And there is the golden thread that you can trace right from the GDS to the local area plans. That is my presentation for today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Andile. So uh, participants who've just joined in late, welcome. And uh, this is us, the city of Ikuruleni, celebrating World Town Planning Month with you. If you were wondering the presentation that was um, just completed, we are discussing the topic around the impact of growth and development in South Africa, a futuristic approach for cities, and we've just given our story as a city of Ikuruleni. We have a long-term plan that we call the Growth and Development Strategy, and the presentation that just happened now from my colleague Andile is an indication or example of how do you take a long-term plan that has a futuristic uh, approach till 2055 and you break it down into annual targets. This was very exciting because we've been able to demonstrate uh, to you, Joss, and uh, to those listening in from the National Treasury of how we've looked at sustainable urban integration um, jobs and economic growth and development, issues around the social environment, um, environmental well-being and efficiency of cooperative governance. What came out from the presentation that was done is how we tried to link our infrastructure needs, capacities, as informed by the population trends and migration urbanization, We've looked at how best to look at budgeting of this infrastructure. At certain times, yes, it's grants. At certain times, as cities or a municipality, we need to look at our borrowings and how these investments are then going to yield revenue for us. The issue of locality was also very important. Where do we do these investments? And to what extent do these meet the needs of the poor or what we've promised politically in terms of our integrated development plan? Andile gave a demo around the various infrastructure capacities and the scenarios that will then in impact on where it is that we do these investments. He also touched on the spatial principles that are key in this regard if we are targeting a sustainable city, as well as the targeted investments. And I think this touches on more so on the private sector and to what extent you can come on board. And also for me, during this World Planning Month, as planners, do we have the skills that will assist us to gear towards the long-term planning that came out of the city. And the one horror that um, Andile didn't touch on, and I'm going to, is the fact of uh, integration. So how do we align, not just internally as city planning, with the various infrastructure departments, roads, water, energy, real estate, economic development, transport, environment, but how do we align externally with the other spheres? Hence, we have you on board with us, Joss, uh, from the National Department of Cooperative Governance and the partnerships that we have with the National Treasury. But having completed the story on public sector, how then do we integrate best with uh, the private sector and also internationally potential donor funding? So this gives us a story a little bit more of Ekuruleni. And I hope we've assisted to demonstrate how it is that we have developed a targeted approach, moving away from what was purely basic industrial and manufacturing to a city that is going to be sustainable and exciting. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would then like to introduce an old friend and a former colleague in the space of the built environment, Mr. Josiah Lodi who is currently a Chief Director at the National Department of Cooperative Governance in Urban Development Planning. Similar to me, he has 20 years experience in the integrated and uh, the intergovernmental development planning space. He's a qualified urban and regional planner. I refer to him as Joss. We've come a long way in this planning journey to you, his Josiah Lodi. 
and he has worked in various fields of spatial and collaborative planning, land use planning, geographic information systems, which also launches and celebrates as well its World Town Planning Day today, urban policy development and implementation, integrated planning and intergovernmental planning. And he's worked in the three provinces of South Africa, Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape. Welcome, Joss, over to you. And to our media partner, if you can also at the same time prepare to then fly to the presentation from Joss. And I'm hoping that Joss, I love the spirit that your cover page is within our Aerotropolis. And what is a test for us within the built environment is that when we meet again and have this session 20 years later, I wonder then what will be your image of the city of Ekurileni. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson Palisa, um, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, between you and I, I refer to you as Pali. And indeed, we, we've come a long way um, as colleagues um, in the built environment space. Um, thanks very much for that um, generous introduction. Um, I do hope I'm audible and that everyone can, can hear me. Um, so yeah, I, I was actually listening with great interest um, on the different inputs um, from the colleagues from the city. Um, I feel inspired, I feel energized. I'm actually very, very impressed with the work that the city of Ekurleni is doing. Um, in fact, I was saying to, to a colleague that, you know, um, perhaps I should have started first, but then again, um, we work together as a three spheres of government. Uh, before I get into my presentation, let me uh, congratulate the city for, for the webinar. I think it's a fantastic initiative. Um, but also I'd like to say to, to you and every planner from around the world and everybody on the platform to say um, happy World Town Planning Month. Um, and I think as urban planners or town planners in the space, um, let's please uh, I think celebrate this day and create the conversations that we need to have about the work that we're doing in planning. Uh, we all know how important planning is um, to our cities, to the development of our cities, uh, but also to making sure that we're changing the lives of communities out there. Um, so if I can ask my presentation to be loaded, please, we'll appreciate that. Thank you very much. So colleagues, I think um, before I get into the presentation, I, th I think the the approach that you're going to see um, and, and hopefully appreciate is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, would be based on a national perspective of, of what we at national government, at least in the Department of Cooperative Governance, um, are thinking um, about the future of our cities, but more specifically about the importance of um, what we call long-term planning, and um, others call it long-range planning. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I want to move from a point of departure that, that makes a very simple point. And we, we, we saying um, as, 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 as national government, but to, quite frankly, globally, um, cities matter. Um, we are want to acknowledge the strategic importance of our cities, uh, but especially the metropolitan municipalities um, um, in, in the country. Um, why cities matter? They matter for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm just sharing through two, three or four of them in this slide. Essentially because they have become historically over a period of time, uh, the magnet of urbanization. A lot of people are, gravi are gravitating to these urban centers. Uh, we are seeing, and this urbanization, this movement of people to the city spaces, Ekorlene, Johannesburg, Etiquette and so on, happening at a very rapid rate over the last decade. We anticipate that as COVID is happening and passes, this rate of urbanization is going to increase even faster. Um, we also see that already, this is pre-COVID, um, there is an anticipation of about 71% um, of people would actually be living in our urban centers in 2030 and about 80% by 2050. 
So this trend of people moving into our cities, into our urban spaces is not declining. In fact, it might just grow much, much faster moving forward. I have no doubt that there are already studies that are projecting these figures to be higher. Why this is important? It's important because the context within which we exercise our planning and, and processes needs to take into account the impact of this urbanization, the people that are, are coming to our cities. Um, and as it, as it stands, we're beginning to see um, things that we're calling the urban disease, um, as, as it were. These are challenges of um, population growth overload. We're seeing traffic congestion. We're seeing housing shortages. We're seeing environmental degradation. We're also seeing um, service delivery backlogs that are beginning to become much more challenging um, for our cities. Um, to be able to, to cope on their own in, in, in terms of responding to these. Um, I also contend that this is my argument that if, if cities fail, then South Africa is not going to be able to work. In other words, we need our metropolitan cities and our intermediate cities for that matter to succeed. Why? Because they are the engines of growth and development. They are quite critical. Um, in terms of making sure that um, we, we work. For instance, if you look at the slide on, on your right, it demonstrates, and this is a slide, and I'm, I'm sure if, um, I don't know if colleagues from the city have the latest stats here. Um, at the point which when we were doing the profiles for the city of Okoland, which was um, around June, uh, using a bit older of all of us, you can see that the economy of the metro is, is somewhat, it's slowly declining from 2011. It's a bit on the decline. I, I can almost predict that due to the impact of COVID, this decline is going to it might dip a bit further, uh, fairly quicker, and perhaps over time um, um, it start, start going up. But we're finding that a lot of our cities, and I'm not talking only about Jacobelani here, we've looked at all the metros. Um, economically, and their performance is declining over a period of time, which is becoming a concern because this as the engines of growth. We need these cities to actually succeed, to prosper, to be able to create that enabling environment that we want for, 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 for our people to actually um, have jobs in the private sector to come in and invest. Um, the last point I'm making on this slide is that we've done quite a lot of work in terms of introducing short-term to medium-term planning in the 24, 25 years of, 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 of South Africa since 1994. And we want to, I want to argue through my input that those medium and short-term planning interventions are no longer enough. They're just not sufficient. They're not going to take us to the future that we want to see. Uh, you have already seen uh, the presentations from both NIT and Andila demonstrating how the cities begin to say, okay, we, 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 we're done talking about five-year plans. We now want to go 35-year plan. We want to look at project 20, 30, 40, 50 years. This is a global trend and the city is literally on, on track, not only with global trend, but what, with what we are saying in the, in, in the policy instruments that we've recently introduced. I'll talk to those in the, in the next slide. Thanks very much, Shana. Next slide, please. Um, so the next couple of slides, I'm just going to make one argument, which I hope will be coherent enough for everyone. And it, the argument is this, we have sufficient legal and policy frameworks that allows us to pursue um, integrated intergovernmental long-term planning, starting from the, um, um, the, R, the, the Reconstruction and Development Program, uh, the White Paper on Local Government, and our Constitution, in particular Section 152, 153, and 154. I won't read through this, colleagues can read through these slides at their own leisure, but this is the, the foundation that says, actually, let's ensure that as we do our planning, medium, short, and specific, long-term, we prioritize the basic needs of our communities. But I think as the HOD and CETA indicated, we need to go beyond that. So we need to provide these basic services, that's the number one priority, but at the city, um, we want to do a bit more than that because we know that the city can actually do much, much more from a small town in, in somewhere in Kofadar in, in the Northern Cape as it were. Thank you very much, we can move on. Um, let me also share with, with, with colleagues on the platform and what the integrated urban development is saying to us about long-term plans. And I literally just, just cited a couple of examples. I won't read everything, but just to, to ground this notion of, of long-term planning. The IUDF in, in, in its policy level one indicates that the cities must develop long-term plans. Why? So that they can guide and manage urban growth. And I think that two previous presentations have just done that. 
And in terms of second bullet point, we can we have also seen that these long terms that the city has begun to talk about are not being developed in isolation of what the national and provincial uh, plans are saying. Perhaps we can strengthen those because I may have missed a thing or two, and we can discuss that if there's room for for a discussion and in the panel on how the um, um, the, the 2055 plan of the city is beginning um, um, to adopt. Um, to, to integrate in the in, in national development plan and other provincial plans and strategies. Um, we've seen um, the, the relationship of how the long-term plans um, is actually informed by the SDF as for the presentation by both Angile and, um, and, and, and Anati. Uh, but also looking at, I mean, the, the point that I'm making to, to everyone here is that the work that the city has presented is actually being reaffirmed by our national urban policy. If you look at number four, that speaks about um, identifying those spatial restructuring zones. I think the, the, the last presentation by, 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 um, by, by Angela did exactly that, which means the city is indeed on the right track in terms of conceptual and theoretical appreciation of what we're trying to do. And lastly, um, you have the pillar four of our integrated um, development framework speaking about institutionalizing long-term, I forgot a word there, infrastructure planning. And this is in particular um, um, talks to, um, 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 I, th I think it is Andile's presentation, that in from, when we're looking at infrastructure as well, we can't do infrastructure planning for the short term only. We are, we, quite frankly, it may only make sense to, to pursue infrastructure planning in the, in, the, in, in the long term. So we do have a very solid urban planning policy basis baseline that actually affirms, that enables us as the three spheres of government to pursue um, the long-term planning that the city has just started to actually um, develop. In fact, I think, I think they're already busy with that and um, probably even finished with that as, as we've heard. Um, thanks very much. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, a lot of us would have heard and, 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 and seen me talking about the district development in different, different platforms. On this slide, instead of taking through all the objectives of the district development um, model, I want to emphasize the last bullet point that talks about inculcating long range planning. Once again, this is a policy uh, program of government. It was approved in August 2019 and emphasized the importance or the significance of long range planning. And what have we seen prior to my input? The city is actually on the journey. The city is actually unpacking the journey of this long range planning, which means as a metro, you are pretty much uh, aligned with the thinking, conceptual thinking, or the appreciation of. Uh, what we see as one of the most important elements of this district development model, which is the long range planning. And thank you very much. And um, I thought I should just throw in a bit of a, a slide that, that reminds us a little bit about um, um, this notion of long term planning and how we as South Africa are a developmental state. Um, never mind Professor Johnson, who's actually coined, um, who actually began to, to help us understand what the development state does. But what's, but what's much more critical is that um, second bullet point where he begins to define what a developmental state is. And he says, I quote, a developmental state takes place when a state, in other words, in this case, the city has a focused role on the growth and development of the economy and undertakes the necessary policy measures to accomplish its long-term objective. Once again, you can see that by developing these long-term plans, we are actually performing, playing our role as a developmental local government, which is, has been expressed by the city of Kuleni. And you can see theoretically from a bit of research that, I, that we've done, we can demonstrate that we're actually the work that we're doing is indeed in, 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 the, in the right track. But what is more important is that last point that talks about the formulation of a common national agenda. Here I want to perhaps just indicate that while it is fantastically great to do this um, the, 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 the city development strategies and so on of, of, of that the Metro has done, um, Chair, uh, you've spoken about it, it's, it becomes quite critical to ensure that whatever it is that the city is doing, that we as province and as national spheres of, of government get on board and support and work with you so that we can um, basically um, give reality to bring to reality that notion of a common national agenda 
in the Kurleni Metropolitan Municipality. In other words, while it is good to develop the city development strategy within the metro, uh, let's ensure that we bring with us, and this is where both provincial national COPT and national treasury would need to come in with other sector departments to say, yes, indeed, we agree that this is the agenda that we would like to drive, a common national agenda that we want to drive within this metropolitan municipality. Why? Um, so that we can rally social, so the societal stakeholders in business and government. Um, Chair M. Sita spoke to this. The, one of the powerful realities or importance of agreeing on this common national agenda within the metropolitan of, 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 of Etiquini so that we can say to businesses, we can say to private investors, to donors, Yes, this is what we believe needs to happen in the metropolitan municipality of, 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 of a Kurulene, as it were, and then have that agreed upon um, agenda and move forward. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, so we can move to the next slide. I'm not going to say, say too much about this slide, um, except to emphasize once again the really affirming that from what we've had, if you look at your top right um, on this slide, you'll see we're talking about 521 plans. And just underneath there, we're defining what they are, and we're calling them long-term strategic frameworks that emanates from joint planning, budgeting, and implementation over multiple cycles. This is really um, what the city has begun to do, I accept that what we want to do as national and province, we want to make sure that we walk this journey with the city so that when it comes to us as national and province, needing to review and reprioritize our programs and budget, we can do that to support the city to implement its vision and it, or its agenda for the next um, um, 25, um, I think you, in this case, you have about 35 years. Um, in terms of your, 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 your current long-term plan. That is essentially what the district development does. It actually, in the value proposition here is to say, let's do this long-term planning process together. That way we can reprioritize budgets because um, I, th I think Andrea spoke to this. On its own, the city may not have sufficient money uh, to implement a lot of what they want to do, firstly, and secondly, there are inevitably programs that national spheres of government and province are actually planning in some cases they, they've started to implement those in the city space. So we want to get to a point where we say, but hang on, why are we as national and province doing these things if they're not in line, if they're not responding to the challenges that the city has been talking about uh, for some time or even now? Therefore, let's change those. Let's contribute to the city's agenda collectively as one government. Um, thanks very much. If we can move to the next slide. Um, the key message of, of, of this slide is, if you look at, I think it's, let's call it the middle column in the lack of a better word, that starts from lack of coherence all the way to, um, I think there's words that, that reads no real joint planning. And this is the, thank you very much, yeah, that one, it's, it's a beautiful light green. Um, I don't know if I'm colorblind, but I hope I'm not at this point. So um, if one of the things that we're trying to really get rid of or to, to actually do differently through what we, the district development, is to actually move away from, um, and we're really very deliberate on this, the notion of, of sharing plans and calling that joint planning. We want to get to a point where we are actually sitting in one room, assuming COVID is gone, we have a vaccine and everybody's healthy and we can have fun again. And uh, we can actually do proper joint planning as opposed to what we've been doing where um, I sit at national, I do my plan, and then when I'm done with my plan, I send it to um, the HOD to say, HOD, this is what national is doing. Then HOD looks at me, it's like, but you know, who told you to do this? It doesn't make sense because I want to do something else as a city and province comes up and say, no, I'm going to do a development in a different space. And then they say, no, this is my plan, this is the money that I've allocated. That is what has been happening in South Africa not only in Ecuador, pretty much across provinces and municipalities, we want to actually dismantle that notion to say, let's sit and rather fight it out in one room, and I don't mean in a physical sense, but I mean conceptually, have robust discussions on actually agreeing on saying, these are the things that we need to do. That, that is what we mean by real joint planning as opposed to sharing of documents. And we've seen this all around where we do cut and paste of, of, of of sections in the document, the outcome 1.1 is linked to outcome 1.3 in the IDP and so on. That's a kind of way frame that we really want to get rid of to say, let's have a real conversation so that we can move forward. Thank you very much. If we can move on. Um, 
And this is something that uh, we, we, um, we, we need to also, in some ways, take advantage of. And this is really the, the whole um, notion of, of COVID-19 and really the understanding the, the, impact, the impact of COVID-19 and, and the fact that we can actually leverage on what COVID-19 has taught us and to use it to actually start transforming the ownership patterns um, in our communities um, to strengthen the social safety net, uh, to un unlock um, value chains, and to do a lot, lot more, but also to strengthen our economic um, um, development programs and so on. We need to basically leverage on, on COVID-19 so that we can basically uh, do things better, smarter, and are much more efficient. Chair, I see, I see your, your, your own. I'm not sure if I'm in trouble or not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay. okay, I think that's the fun. So what, what underpins the, the notion of the long-term planning? And this is really a national perspective. It obviously needs to, to be harmonized with the thinking and the innovation in the city. We are saying, let's understand what the endowment structure looks like in our, in our cities, in obviously in other spaces, in the DDM language, we're talking districts. And let's unpack what the comparative advantages are. I have no doubt that the city knows what they are. And then let's optimize those and ensure that we leverage on the good things that we currently have within our cities. And what does it mean? It means one, we need to choose the right targets. We need to remove the binding constraints. The binding constraints that we as typical planners often grapple with is the time that it takes to approve um, land use applications. The binding constraints in terms of um, how quickly does it take for someone to, to open, to get a certificate for um, what to, uh, to, to start a business. All those things that the city can actually do fairly quickly, but also the bigger ones. If someone wants to come and invest in a, a city of Ekuruleni, um, to, where do they find information? Those are some of the things that we need to actually do away with and make sure that these things happen fairly quickly, fairly easy. That way, what, what happens in summer three, we start attracting global investors. We need to be very much deliberate on that and so on. So the, 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 the philosophy, let me put that, that underpins our perception, our approach to this long-term planning is really on this positive thing, the things that are actually making this, that, that are going to make the city to prosper. We need to target those, isolate those, leverage on them, and ensure that we actually get as much as possible from them to, to, to create inclusive growth. If we can move to the next slide, which continues from this one, um, and it's really this. It means that we see the long-term plan as that plan that actually massifies and op op optimizes industrial, um, the industrial structure of the economy. They, they scratch a bit, and I think they, they, the HOD is even showing just to say, uh, we, we actually sick and tired of talking about infrastructure industry and so on. We actually <laughs> want to do a bit more than that. Um, but what we're saying is that based on the comparative advantage that exists in the, in the metro, it's critical that we start marshalling all of our society structures and that includes the partnerships, that means the university that's come into the city, that means um, um, the NGOs, that means the communities, it means young people, it means women. Um, if it means that we must go to some kind of a fantastic skills revolution where we're targeting young uh, youth and women, and we train them on the skills that they need to participate in the economies that exist in the, in, in the metro, let's do that. Obviously, we'd need to partner with those entities that provide those skills. What we do, we actually in increasing the skills pool that exists in the metro, um, so that those people can earn an income, but they can, so they can also benefit and probably pursue entrepreneurial opportunities where they see them. Um, I think the city has got fantastic major projects. Um, let's capture those projects. Um, let's package them. Let's make sure that um, when um, and the PICC says, you know, we have an investment conference, let's come up, let's put, put those forward so that they can, um, get, they can get funded. And that, that's really some of our thinking around the, 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 the long-term plan that we're talking about at a very much strategic level. And uh, next slide, please. Chair, I'm feeling intimidated. Um, so I've spoken to the slide in the previous slide, so I'm only going to emphasize the very last point that talks about um, how we perceive the one plan as this the key, I think, um, let's say a magical ingredient is that intergovernmental plan that is developed collaboratively in the three spheres of government. 
Obviously, in the city of Ukulele, it's going to build on the fantastic work that you have done. So we're going to say, in fact, I think we can do this in a very short space of time, where we can rally the three spheres to say, let's do this together. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. And this is really the process that we're proposing, but this is really neither here nor there for the city, because I think um, if you look at it, really, you look at it and say, okay, but we actually have done a lot of this. You would find that in terms of when you're talking about the demographic analysis, you've got that, spatial analysis, you've got that. So a lot of these ingredients that makes up the national um, cocktails process of one to one plan. You look and say, okay, we're good to go. We just need to unpack and discuss the content and find a way forward. So I'm not going to go through the details of that. Thank you very much. Um, I hope the slides does does what it's what I needed to do. If we can press everything, because there's a lot more here that's that should be that show up here. Shannon, if you can just keep pressing and see if everything else shows up. Yeah, let's get it. Carol. Thank you. And while that is happening, um, I'm using Waterberg as an example, and and the the, the real story here of how we wanted to. Um, reconceptualize um, the one plan. We are saying, and that we're using the term deliberately, we want to reimagine Waterbeck. In, in, in the case of Ukraine, we'll be talking about reimagining um, the city of Ukraine. In, in what way? In a sense that we begun, begin to understand what are some of those things that make the district of the metro tick for us to actually reimagine. And I'm going to replace Waterbeck here with the city of Ukraine. Um, the, 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 the metro differently. As you can see in Waterbeck, we know that there's a um, comparative advantage in terms of um, agro-processing, manufacturing, mining, trade, um, not ocean economy in, in Waterbeck, there isn't that, but there's an error. If ICT, auto industry, um, a possible new city, um, I don't know if you have that, but perhaps not, a new secondary city. So, so this, is, this is the approach that, that we actually want you to push forward in terms of reimagining our cities and our metros in, in, in this case to say, what are those things that are actually going to help us reimagine our cities looking different, looking much more exciting, looking vibrant, and where everybody can prosper in them. This is the approach that we're following with the other districts. I just thought I should use the one for, for Waterbeck. I suppose I could have taken it to Kuni, but I didn't want uh, the HOG to, to fight with me to say you're bringing another metro's example in my home. <laughs> and if we can go one back, and um, from national, what are we seeing? Um, and this might be too, too elementary for yourselves. Um, as we talk about reimagining the city of Ukraine, I thought I should just pick up a couple of examples. People are your first um, asset. Um, and, and we be content that you have a youth population. That, that is the one most powerful asset that we believe the city has, and that can help us, it can help it to reimagine um, the, 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 the city. Um, if we don't invest in our people, obviously, um, a lot of things are going to go on. Location, um, HOD spoke about that. You're located, and I have a map in this one, um, strategically. Um, as, as a major transport hub, you've got a lot of national roads that actually positions you strategically within the global, say, the Houghton City region. Um, I've seen somewhere where uh, people are referring you as, as, as the desire to become um, Africa's workshop. I don't know if that's, that still holds if you graduated from that. Um, but but, but the, the point there is that you're locating the metro within the African context and you're actually forming your own identity which is fairly unique to the metro, which is one of the journeys of beginning to reimagine the city, which I think is quite, 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 quite powerful and it's useful. If there's a replacement to, the Afri to Africa's workshop, whatever it is, it's really around, when somebody is somewhere in, in London and they want to think about it, really, what, what stands out? Um, the transport hub, you've got all time international airport. I don't, need, I don't need to tell you about this. Um, A to C. So you have a lot of these assets that can help you rebrand, reimagine, reposition, and recommunicate and take advantage of a whole lot of investments that are being brought, some of them by yourself, others by the other spheres of, 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 of government, others, quite frankly, by, by international investors. Um, for instance, if, if World Tambo doesn't work, um, the country is actually going to be in deep trouble. And the Ortama sits in the metro space of the city of Ukulele, which means the city needs to actually leverage on, on, on the location of this strategic national asset, which is Ortama International Airport. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really can, I will literally skip this because it's a bit of a repeat. Um, so it's really around, the slide was really around the location. I've mentioned this around the 
the strategic location of the various national routes. And I, I'm trying to think really hard if anybody in the room can help me remember if there's any other metro that has so many national routes that cuts across it, they, they can please share it. I think there's at least three or four that cuts across the, the, um, the, the metro. And what do they do? These, these are corridors that are connecting um, provinces. These are corridors where movement happens. People um, use these national routes to um, transport goods, conduct businesses, and there is no reason why the city cannot literally um, um, leverage a lot out of those. The N12, N17, N3, um, North-South um, corridor, it, it's clear, East-West corridor, it's clear, um, and, 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 and what do you call it? Um, and then the, and, and the, and the, and Bumbalanga is well connected to, 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 to the metro as well. So these are some of the assets that the city can actually begin to leverage on. Um, I think I'm almost, almost finished, um, Jody. I think if this is not the second last slide. Um, and I've, I've spoken about this, HOD, and this I've got from the Gauteng um, Growth Something Something in 2013. And um, it talks about the 200 billion investment. Um, that, that, that could potentially assist in, 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 in the metro. This is for me quite, quite a powerful statement. And it goes back to the point of saying, if we want to actually reimagine the city of Ukraine, can we afford not to agree and have a discussion of what provinces intentions are through the 2030 um, um, plan? Because they've actually deliberately pronounced themselves uh, on, on the potential that they see in the metro. I think it's something that needs to get moved into, into, into the discussion. Um, I believe this is my last slide, the next one. I thought I should just end with, with a, a quote. I don't know if it's going to be interesting at all, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and it's really to say the best way to predict your future is to create it. And I think the city is on the journey to creating your future. And um, this is a quote by Abram Lincoln. And I think um, collaboratively working with yourself, HD and your team, um, and province, uh, we, we, we definitely can, can, can do it. Now, I want to urge and encourage the city to say, um, let's definitely create the city that we want to do, the future of the city in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Josiah Lodi from uh, the National Department of Cooperative Governance a friend in the built environment and also someone that I, from time to time, rely uh, on for uh, spatial expertise. There's various ways in which the topic of this webinar could have been approached. The topic, for those of you who came in late, the impact of growth and development in South Africa, a futuristic approach for cities. There's also various ways in which the webinar could have also been approached, whether you have national COCTA first and then the city response or the other way around. Be as it may, I think what is then important for those who are experiencing our city in a different way that we are presenting it, linking it to our growth and development strategy, our integrated infrastructure master plan, as well as our long-term financial plan, is that it somewhat gives you a better perspective as to what extent we are aligned to the urban development framework. And maybe, Joss, as you were mentioning some of these things, that, that it is now for the participants to tick whether or not as a city, one of the cities in South Africa and in Africa, if we are an African workshop, is that does the city have long-term plans? I think we can tick that. We've demonstrated in our GDS that was presented by our head of department for corporate um, strategy, strategy planning and anti. To what extent are we aligned? I think participants, you can also give us a tick on that, having received the presentation from COCTA and having been also attached on the issues alignment to province. To what extent are we guiding investment? We've demonstrated this through the spatial frameworks, the precinct plans. We've also identified very deliberately integration zones and core areas where we're trying to create a compact city. We've also demonstrated the spatial zones that will also leverage further investments and how we can, for example, begin to also um, access the 200 billion that you spoke about, Joss. And to what extent is this institutionalized within Ekuruleni? You can give us a tick. I think that came through from the first presentation, certainly, from Anati. 
and the follow through that also came from Andile. So before I then hand over uh, Shannon to the question and answer session, just to pick up on what I think were the three C's coming out of the session. I think the first one that uh, we can begin to give an enormous amount of comfort to province and also to national with regards to where we're going. I believe we're no longer working in silos or we're trying to a certain extent, greater extent to be more aligned and integrated. The second C is that we're in a position certainly to better convince the private sector that um, we have targeted approaches and we recognize very, very much our comparative and our competitive edge and how we're certainly looking at cutting the red tape and we're happy to engage more in terms of the kind of town planning scheme that we are developing that is more robust, reduces red tape and also embraces the illegalities or informalities that you find across the city. And certainly the last C, I think tying up in where we are right now during World Town Planning Month is to give an enormous amount of certainty um, with regards to the profession and the professionals that are within this um, built environment space. I think then looking at the time, we did try very much to stick to um, the time limit, but I think, um, Fellow panelists and ladies and gentlemen, you would agree that um, in linking up with the topic and certainly just to give a little bit more background for those who are experiencing in Kudalini in this way, we needed to go the full length and cover these issues. I think from my side as host, I'm done. I think then Shannon, given your expertise on this kind of media platform, uh, given the safety protocols of the COVID-19 that we meet virtually, if I can then hand over to you to then facilitate the question and answer session. It also gives me an opportunity to have a sip of water. Thank you. Thanks very much, Palesa. It seems I've been looking at the Q&A here. We just had one question, which Josiah has very um, kindly answered um, in, the, in the panel already. Um, the question was from Nosi Mgaga, and she, he, sorry, I'm not sure, this person says, do we have partnership policies in the city? And Josiah said it would be useful to discuss this and hear the city's perspective on the future prospects. So I'm not sure if any of our panelists would like to perhaps discuss, discuss a bit on, on that question. I am uh, joined by uh, two uh, gentle men and uh, gentle colleagues uh, from the city. Our head of department, Anati Zutumani, um, within the strategy um, department of the city, as well as uh, Andile from a metro spatial planning perspective. Uh, gentlemen, you now have an opportunity to also just uh, give the response um, a bite. Um. Thank you, HOD. No, I'll take uh, one response, okay, uh, the partnership one. Um, I can gladly say, I think three weeks ago, we went on a business day to actually um, request investors to watch out on one of the initiatives that we're working with as a metro to call on the external parties uh, in, in, in providing opportunities. I think it's going to be this week, Friday, or next week, Friday, we are calling people, uh, investors, and business to say, look, uh, we are a metro. We need additional ways of revenue stream. So uh, it's going to be out in next week or two. I can assure you on that. That gives the opportunity for us to say we are not making uh, as much money as we should in some areas. What do you suggest? Okay. And then also what other additional revenue streams that we can maximize on? We may find we are not making as much in areas like your non-revenue water and energy, those areas that we know that uh, we know we're bleeding in terms of resources financially. So technology can come with alternative ways and there may be some issues out there that we are not aware which business must partner with us. The triple P's, we are actually going to advertising, I think two of them in Jamestown. So, uh, and uh, a whole lot more that we keep advertising. I think in the past few months we advertise 
there's a lot more partnership that we're getting and we would like business to partner with us. Um, yeah, and also technology in the technology space, what can we do to actually ensure? I'm passionate about that one uh, because our COVID has taught us a few lessons and I'm sure uh, people will come up with alternative ways as to how can we use uh, our existing uh, electric poles to make them smart poles and how to get ready for 5G and uh, all the related matters. But um, all I can gladly say is we are in support of the DTM for working with it. And uh, the GDS talks a lot more on the Aerotropolis and us, our position in the city. And COVID-19, I can tell you, has taught us a few lessons. So probably in some of the proposals will have our COVID-19 compliant ones and taking the metro to the next level. So uh, let me end there for now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anati. Thank you, HOD. Andile? And then I'll come in just after you. Okay, maybe he's trying to reconnect. Let me run with that. There was also another question that came in on the side around the economy of the city declining. I think how I'd like to respond to this, given that we've got um, COCTA and National Treasury on the platform, is that it is not just the economy of the city, but I think the economies of all cities or all of the municipalities within the country. And the extent to which is declining, um, certain issues are within our control as cities or municipalities, and certain issues are beyond the control. So if I can touch on the point that was made by our HOD strategy with regards to the fact that COVID-19 pandemic has certainly taught us a lot, is that in certain instances as, a munis as, as municipalities or cities, to what extent were we proactive against resilience around such pandemics? To what extent are we preactive? What do we currently have in place to assist us in this regard? Our policies, our schemes, our reserves. To what extent were we then reactive? So how were we able to respond to the national lockdown that was unexpected and to be able to continue to provide services in an efficient manner and to what extent maybe are we non-active and this will then touch again on the issue of how ready were we i think with the digital economy some were still on 3g fourth industrial revolution but we are now ready to now follow through on um, the 5g and where does that leave us the economies of cities will decline because we are also regulated by what happens uh, countrywide. So the sovereign credit rating, that is beyond our control, and it will also affect us at our own level as cities to what extent are we rated when we're given our short-term rating profile and our long-term rating profile. I mentioned some of the infrastructure grants, thanks to the National Treasury and the Division of Revenue, where we can exploit the grants. But in certain instances, when we have gone out to borrow, what is then the capability? And because of the pandemic, when we find that the economy is declining, more and more families are losing uh, jobs. And we've heard recently also what is happening um, across the world or in the news with the SAA retrenchments, uh, personally also in the family we're affected by this, is that how then do residents able to pay their rates and taxes? Those who are the top rate payers, our industries in manufacturing, um, real estate, uh, all these developments that you see along the major routes, Josiah, that you spoke about, when they're not able to pick up on that revenue, what do we do? So we can, to a certain extent, do as much as we can to improve the look and feel on the city. So keep the streets clean, keep um, our lights on at night, be able to recoup revenue from our traffic fines, <laughs> guilty as charged, and also a whole host of things as to what kind of bulk developments or investments do we put so that these can then bring us a return on rates? But it becomes very tricky. And also, as you know, in, in terms of the constitution, that local government receives a lesser um, 
of the allocation, local governments, municipalities, us as emerging cities rely very much on rates and revenue to recoup um, what is there. And the challenges that we have with the exorbitant bills from our um, ESCOM and our Joburg Water, when residents are not able to um, pay as much as we ought to pay our infrastructure service uh, providers. So on that note, I don't know if I've allowed for any creative juices to flow. Do we have any economists? I learned a new term on Monday, agroeconomists as well, given that uh, we have an agricultural sector in the city. And um, to those who have also joined the webinar from the National Treasury, I've touched on money. And I'm sure this also opens up for you to then come in. I'm not sure, Shannon, from your side, if you're able to pick up any more questions and indication of hands from uh, our other colleagues who may want to come in. Um, talking about economy, comparativeness, competitiveness of cities, alignment with the other sectors as well. Um, I just received Shana? some, some uh, message from Josiah. He said he would like to also touch on the um, declining economy in the city. So Josiah, if you'd like to, to take up that one. Thanks very much, um, Shannon and, and colleagues. Um, I, I think the, the, it's really just a contribution. I, I fully agree with, with um, HUD's points on, on the, the challenges and her observations um, about the the declining economies of all the cities and the metros. That, that's what evidence is actually showing us. Uh, we started to see the decline even pre-COVID. Um, what, what I wanted to perhaps talk to and, and, and to check in, in some respects, share a bit um, with, with colleagues in the, in the city is that um, last, I think a few days ago, we had an interaction with the city of Etikuni. I went there, uh, where they've developed um, an economic recovery plan. And what they said is that um, they've done it, it's been adopted by council, um, but the challenges that they're beginning to get is the funding that they need to implement some aspects of the economic recovery plan. And they broke it down to us to this level of detail. They say, I think everybody knows that there's a Hilton Hotel next to the ICC in, in, in Durban. And they said the ICC, the, the Hilton Hotel is threatening to, to shut its doors. And, and they wrote the ICA, they, the Hilton Hotel wrote to, to the city and said, uh, we're not coping. Um, the COVID-19 has hit us hard. But what can you as a city do to help us to keep others open? Um, and the city then wrote to province and said, you know, we can put so much in the kitty to assist the Hilton. To, that is really the notion of attracting international investment and investment in the city. Um, and the province would need to come into the kitty to say, we can do one, two, three. Um, to actually retain you, to help you to, to stay until such a time that we're back, back on track. And the point here being that um, while there's these economic recovery plans, there'll be instances where funding the implementation of these economic recovery plans to at least sustain the economies of the city so that they really don't collapse any further. There will be a need to get support from provinces and national, national departments. For instance, the notion that, that the HOD mentioned of, of a national treasury cutting of budgets across three spheres. There's a school of thought that says that can't happen in the cities um, because it's got a lot of implications. And I know that the South African Local Government Association is fighting the cities battle on that to say you can't actually cut the, the grants that the cities are getting. But perhaps the, the bigger point is whether the city has done any work on the um, recovery plan. And, and how are they working on getting it implemented to at least sustain what currently exists so that you don't lose um, some of the major investments that said, should they approach you as well? Because some of them would probably approach the city and say, hey, we really don't want to go uh, and we don't want to go to a cost of reputation or risk, uh, but what can you do as a metro to, to help us to stay for a little bit longer uh, while we put in five cents and then you can put two or three cents if you feel so. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, those seem to be the only questions that we've had so far. Um, so yes, Palesa, I, I'll turn over to you to give the farewell and then I will, I will end the meeting for you. Thank you uh, to Josiah. It's certainly very wonderful. I think that um, as a city, we're able to have access to national government in the manner that we do through you. Thank you also to the National Treasury 
for the teachings around how to make deliberate decisions and identification of our corridors, our nodes, to be able to leverage investments. And uh, thank you to the participants for sharing your time with us. We hope that during this World Planning Month, you've been able to achieve a lot more of information and certainty around uh, the city of Ikuruleni and uh, with what remains of the available and developable land that we are still as appetizing as an option for you in as much as um, you enjoy this with other cities. I'd also like to thank uh, fellow colleagues who've assisted in this regard and once again to yourself uh, Crema Media for professionalizing our event. If I can then hand over then to you and also to thank Andile for his presentation and um, we hope to hear a lot more from the participants who certainly listened and we're trying to also update our website on the internet with a whole lot more of uh, such kind of information so that uh, when there is silence and there isn't a buzz around uh, planning festivities the information is there for you thank you shannon Thank you so much, Palesa. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of our panelists for joining us today. And also thank you very much to the attendees for taking the time to join this webinar. Please be sure to join the next webinar, which takes place on Tuesday, the 24th of November at uh, 10 a.m. It's hosted in conjunction with the City of Ekuruleni and the SA Cities Network. The link to register has been posted in the chat, and you can also find the information on Engineering News or on the City of Ekuruleni website. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. I thank you so much for your time. Stay well and goodbye.